Chapter 5 Part 3 By taking a careful look at such empty search results, you can identify the type of information that is not effectively being found on your site. We once helped a client in the wine business to significantly improve their search function by returning proper results for common misspellings of wine brands and specific product names. By insisting that the visitor must be able to type in searches correctly, many sites are turning away business. You can also auto-populate common empty search results with hand-picked search results pages. Alternatively, you can broaden the scope of the search to at least bring back close matches if exact results are not found. If a search is very common it may be a candidate for inclusion in the site's permanent navigation. In other words, you may want to enshrine the search result with permanent visibility to help even more people find it, since a small minority of them will bother to use the search function. Sophisticated on-site search from companies like SLI Systems can actually adapt search results and even site navigation by monitoring search queries and click-throughs. They use historical data collected from all site visitors to serve up more popular results, thus improving the relevance of the user experience. You may also want to consider using private label search capabilities from major search vendors such as Google. This can often give much better results than a home-built system. Usability testing. Usability testing, as described in Chapter 3 allows you to test your design ideas on actual representative user of your website. It can be an effective means of uncovering disconnects between users' expectations and your designs. Usability testing companies can help you recruit appropriate subjects, conduct the tests, and deliver detailed findings. But usability testing can often be done expensively and rather informally. After running as few as three subjects through your mission-critical conversion task, you can often uncover significant issues with your current landing page. All you need for this kind of informal approach is a quiet room, a mock-up of your proposed design possibly just hand-drawn on paper, and a clear task statement of what you want your subjects to accomplish. There are several alternative protocols for the tester to get information from the subjects. SiteTuners.com has found an effective one to be asking subjects to narrate their internal thoughts as they attempt to complete the task. In this protocol, the testers are silent and simply observe or take written notes. Most marketers are shocked when first watching actual users struggle with a seemingly simple assigned task. Because they have been so close to the design of the pages, they are familiar with the conversion action and the page content. Because of this, they have a hard time putting themselves in the shoes of first-time visitors. After the initial shock has worn off, many marketers have a much higher degree of empathy for their audience and can see the landing page problems in a new light. Usability Reviews You do not always have to conduct full-scale usability testing. Hiring usability experts for a high-level review of your landing pages is often a terrific investment. Usability experts have seen dozens or even hundreds of poor designs and have learned to extract subtle commonalities. They can quickly focus on potential problems without even conducting a usability test. Besides their testing expertise, usability experts also bring an outside perspective and a mandate to uncover problems. Often organizations that would be reluctant to take input from their own staff will listen to the advice of a hired expert. Focus groups Focus groups, like usability tests, draw on people from the target audience. Via moderated group discussion, insights can be gleaned about user needs, expectations, and attitudes. These findings can be compared to the proposed solution to determine if key elements are missing or are incorrect. Of course, focus groups can be easily biased by their more outgoing and assertive participants, and the moderator's influence is important. But this is okay, since the purpose of focus groups is to provide qualitative information that can serve as input into deciding what to test. Eye tracking studies. Eye tracking studies have been used for many years to improve software, as well as the design of other visual systems, such as aircraft cockpit instrumentation. This technology can literally show you what people are looking at, in what order, and for how long. The latest techniques can even monitor involuntary changes in your pupil dilation in order to determine how much attention your brain is devoting to the current object that you are focusing on. Eye tracking technology for website design testing has become cheaper, better, and less obtrusive over time. Recent versions of the hardware look similar to flat screen monitors and do not require that any special gear be worn by the experimental participant. New software visualization techniques and analysis have also made the presentation of eye tracking results more accessible for the mainstream online marketing audience. iTools Incorporated Illustrated in Figure 5.7 and Marketing Sherpa have recently collaborated to conduct some pioneering work specifically on eye tracking for landing page optimization. The iTools heat map is an aggregate of the eye movements of all test subjects looking at a particular landing page. Hotter areas show where subjects spent more of their time. Attempted and successful clicking can also be recorded. Before and after the tests, the subjects can also be asked specific open-ended questions or ones based on the commonly used Likert scale strongly disagree, disagree, neither agree nor disagree, agree, strongly agree. Eye tracking is particularly useful in detecting problems in the earlier stages of the decision process awareness and interest. If most test subjects do not look at the desired part of the page, they are not even aware that the conversion action is possible. In effect, for similar visitors to your site the conversion action does not exist. Such studies are an excellent source of problems regarding page layout, visual presentation of information and images, and emphasis. Customer service reps. Customer service representatives deal with your website visitors' problems all day long. Of course, chat and phone support can proactively help users during key parts of the conversion process. But it would be best if human handholding was minimized. Most companies calculate the reps' contribution and value by focusing on call wait times, average call duration, and customer satisfaction. All of these measures assume that the website problems are here to stay, and that the only possible improvement is, and how efficiently your company can deal with them. 
However, customer service interactions can lead to valuable information about how to actually fix the underlying problems. Feedback can be collected in two ways, direct interviews or surveys of your reps, or a review of actual visitor interactions. Chat and phone call logs can be used to classify problems into categories. The prevalence of particular types of problems can be used as an indication of its severity. Such analysis can also point to where on your site the majority of problems originate. A weakness of customer service-based feedback lies in the self-selecting audience. Only the most dissatisfied and assertive visitors will voice their complaints or escalate their resolution to a rep. This creates a bias toward late-stage issues desire and action, while underestimating the problems with the earlier stages awareness and interest. Early-stage visitors by definition do not have a lot of physiological investment in your company and are much less likely to contact you. Surveys A number of easy web-based and telephone surveying methods and companies are available. Surveys among your target population can be a useful source for discovering additional problems with your site. People who have already completed your conversion action already would seem to be the best group to sample. However, you should generally avoid surveys and interviews of existing users. They are already biased because they have already made the decision to act on your offer. It is better to sample randomly among a pool of people from your intended target audience. Forums and blogs. Many industries have specific communities of interest and popular discussion forums. Even if your company is not a market leader that is mentioned directly in forum posts, you can still gain valuable insight into the concerns and problems of your target audience. Blogs and public comments about blog postings serve very much the same kind of communal discussion function. Such venues allow you to gauge the loyalty or frustration of people, their immediate needs, and attitudes toward your industry, company, or product. Welcome to your brain. In the previous chapter I discussed the four stages of the AIDA decision-making model. I hope that the discussion made sense to you, and you found it rational, clear, and logical. If that is the case, you were probably using your higher reasoning faculties at the time. But this is not the only mode in which your brain operates. Despite the fact that people can be very sophisticated and intelligent, we still carry a lot of our old evolutionary baggage with us. A lot of the problems that we have with the web in general, and landing pages in particular are due to the limitations of our brains when trying to use this medium. There is a disconnect between how our brains evolved and how we are forced to use them on the web. Much of the resulting friction stems from how we actually take in information, process it, learn, and make decisions. It is important for us to understand our own brains when designing better landing pages. So let's take a moment to meet that very odd character, your brain, your three brains. According to Paul McLean, the former chief of the Laboratory of the Brain and Behavior at the United States National Institute of Mental Health NIMH, the older parts of the brain are still with us. McLean developed a model of the brain based on its evolutionary development. According to his triune brain theory there are three distinct layers in the brain that evolved in turn to address new evolutionary needs. Although each layer dominates certain separate brain functions, all three layers also interact in significant ways. McLean said that the three brains operate like three interconnected biological computers, each with its own special intelligence, its own subjectivity, its own sense of time and space and its own memory. The reptilian brain. The first to evolve was the reptilian brain also known as the archipleum, basal brain, or primitive brain. It was called the air complex by McLean, and includes the brain stem and cerebellum. This kind of brain is the high point of development among lizards, snakes, and other reptiles hence the origin of its name. This brain is mainly responsible for physical survival and maintenance of the body including, circulation, breathing, digestion, and movement. It is the brain that takes over in fight or flight situations and is responsible for establishing home turf, reproduction, and social dominance. Since it is responsible for autonomic functions, such as breathing and the heartbeat, it is active even in deep sleep states. The reptilian brain is the basic program that allows animals to function. The reptilian brain can be viewed as obsessive, compulsive, rigid, and automatic. It is not as adaptable or capable of change and will repeat behaviors over and over never learning from its mistakes. The Limbic System the second to evolve was the limbic system also variously called the paleomammalian, intermediate, old mammalian, or midbrain. It includes the hypothalamus, hippocampus, and amygdala. This type of brain is present in most mammals and is dominant in more primitive ones. The limbic system is the seat of our primary centers of emotion, attention, and effective emotion-charged memories. The amygdala is critical in creating the link between emotions and events, while the hippocampus plays the dominant role in storing and recalling memories. The limbic system is in the driver's seat when it comes to value judgments. It decides whether we like something or are repelled by it. Because of this, the limbic system tends to dominate behaviors that involve the avoidance of pain and the compulsive repetition of pleasure including feeding, fighting, sex, fleeing, bonding, and caretaking. It also determines the amount of attention that we give to something and is responsible for much of our spontaneous and creative behavior. The limbic system is connected downward to the reptilian brain and upward to the neocortex. Because it links emotions and behavior, the limbic system often inhibits or overrides the reptilian brain's habitual and unchanging responses. Similarly, the more complex emotions of bonding, attachment, and protective loving feelings connected to the neocortex through rich interconnections. According to McLean, the limbic system decides how it feels about something, and the neocortex is often reduced to simply rationalizing that value judgment decision. The neocortex. The most recent brain to evolve is the neocortex also called the cerebrum, cerebral cortex, neopolium, neomammalian brain, superior brain, or rational brain. It is composed of the two large hemispheres and some subcortical neuronal groups. This development is seen only in primates, and humans have by far the largest version taking up more than two-thirds of total brain mass. 
The neocortex contains specialized areas for controlling voluntary movement and processing sensory information. It is divided into two hemispheres left and right, which control the opposite side of the body, respectively. There is some differentiation in function between the two. The left hemisphere is more linear, verbal and rational, while the right hemisphere is more spatial, artistic, musical, and abstract. Higher cognitive functions are all centered in this brain including language, speech, and writing. It supports logical thinking, and allows us to see ahead and plan for the future. McLean called the neocortex the mother of invention and father of abstract thought. Putting it all together. It is unclear exactly how, and how much the three layers communicate they are connected via an extensive two-way network of nerves. However, it is safe to assume that all three are active during most activities, with a particular one taking the lead in certain situations. The main point is that the neocortex does not dominate the lower levels. The limbic system often asserts its influence over higher mental functions. In times of extreme stress, even our reptilian brain can take over to accomplish seemingly superhuman tasks, such as lifting heavy cars under which people are trapped. When we design landing pages for the web, we must understand that we must often please the limbic system of our visitors. We are being judged on the emotional gut reactions that our pages evoke. Our midbrain knows what it likes and what it doesn't. After the fact logical rationalizations by the neocortex are just that. At some level, the whole point of large-scale statistical landing page testing is to tap directly into this hidden limbic system decision maker and unmask it by seeing its emotionally based actions unmediated by surveys, focus groups, or usability tests that require verbal skills and the ability to explain something. Learning modalities. There are three major ways to get information into your long-term memory. Research has shown that there are no significant differences in the prevalence of these learning styles between the sexes or among different races. Visual learning by seeing auditory learning, by hearing kinesthetic learning, by doing research in teaching has determined that most people have one predominant modality. Some have a more equal balance between two modalities, or even among all three. But there is no single optimal method for transmitting information. Depending on the specific person, different information presentation or teaching techniques will have different levels of effectiveness. Effective web persuasion requires a variety of methods that cover all three learning modalities. If people are aware of their preference they can often assimilate information more efficiently by favoring certain kinds of learning tactics and focusing on specific features of your website. So make it easy for them by providing different ways of interacting with your site when appropriate. This is especially important during the desire stage of the decision process when people are learning about your products or services. Try to use the following types of information to address each learning modality more effectively, visual guided imagery, demonstration, color coding, diagrams, charts, graphs, photos, maps, video clips, auditory audio clips, oral instructions or presentations, poems, rhymes, word association, video clips, live telephone support, kinesthetic games and interactive activities, associating emotions with concepts, props or tangible examples, problem solving, role playing. Keep in mind that this additional information should not be tacked on or gratuitous. But if there are key concepts that you want your audience to understand and remember, you should take the time to customize the experience for each modality and offer them the option of how they want to take in that information. For example, let's assume that you have a template for a product detail page in an e-commerce catalog. You may provide detailed specs and diagrams for your visual learners, a video clip overview of the product's main features and benefits for auditory learners, and a customization wizard, which lets the visitor pick colors and other options that allows the kinesthetic learner to explore, construct, and interact with the product. Constraints and conventions. When visitors come to your website, they are not a blank slate. They carry with them all of the physical and brain machinery that I discussed earlier. They also carry the sum total of their life experiences to date. This includes attitudes, irrational fears, and conscious beliefs, as well as unconscious assumptions. Our beliefs and assumptions have an enormous impact on how we behave. If I have just gotten a static electricity shock from a doorknob, I am going to be more consciously aware of other doorknobs and approach them with apprehension based on the belief that another shock is possible. If I believe that the Earth is flat, as most people did just a few centuries ago, I would not try to circumnavigate the globe, and would be afraid of exploring based on the logical fear of falling off the edge. Most of your visitors already have enormous experience with the Internet. Even recent or casual users have probably logged hundreds of hours interacting with websites. Out of that experience they have constructed a mental model also called the schema of how the web works. Part of that mental model includes constraints things that can't be done and conventions and understanding of how things are commonly done. A convention is a cultural constraint, one that has evolved over time. Conventions are not arbitrary, they evolve, they require a community of practice. They are slow to be adopted, and once adopted, slow to go away. So although the word implies voluntary choice, the reality is that they are real constraints upon our behavior. Use them with respect. Violate them only with great risk. Usability guru Don Norman the model may not be exact or correct. For example, a disturbingly high percentage of people will type a URL into the Google search window instead of into their browser's address window. But this does not matter. As far as you should be concerned, the model is set in stone and not likely to change anytime soon. In his excellent book Don't Make Me Think New Writers Publishing, 2000 author Steve Krug suggests that you should have a firm grounding in common web design conventions and use them whenever possible. They make things easier for your visitors and lessen the mental load and attention required for them to interact with your landing page. Examples of powerful web conventions include the company logo and home dining appear near the upper left corner. The navigation menu is on the left side of the page. The e-commerce shopping cart link is near the upper right corner of the page. Blue underline text is a hyperlink. Right animated rectangular graphics are advertisements. 